You know, 2,000 years ago, an event took place which went unnoticed at first, but later it turned out to be so significant that it actually changed at least a great part of the mankind. The event in itself seems to be of minor importance. One ascetic ate and drank nothing for 40 days before going out to preach. Just think about this fact. Today the preachers and professors come out, they eat and drink every day, they laugh and make jokes, and then they go out, they open their mouth, and something comes out of their mouth. But just take a look at how they prepared themselves before going out to preach, and the ascetic who prepared himself in that way understood that what he would be talking about, these were not just regular or mundane words or thoughts, but it was something unusual that he was about to say, and it was true. This ascetic was Jesus from Nazareth, as you might have understood already, and later he was called Jesus Christ. And I think you remember that at that time when he ended this 40 day, but not just 40 day, but he ate nothing both day and night round the clock. So when he ended this fast, you remember the dialogue that is remarkably interesting. The dialogue which took place on the mountain of temptations. The pilgrims who arrived to Israel usually visit this mount. The dialogue is indeed full of such great depth and meaningfulness, and it is so important for life of every person that it is impossible to overestimate it. Those of you who read the Gospel remember it. After 40 days, Jesus Christ hungered. So if we don't eat a little bit or for a whole day, then we say, we are dying, please give me something. Can you imagine 40 days and how much he hungered? And the devil turns up and says, if you are the Son of God, he obviously doubted or maybe just tempted, command that these stones become bread. And now we are full and we are thinking, what sort of temptation is it? But if a person is hungry, they would eat until their belly is full. But what Jesus Christ answers? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. These are simple words, but what stands behind them? Just please pay attention. What is the bottom line and the major idea of the so-called scientific and technical progress? The, f the first dream was as follows. Of course, there is a great difference whether you dig earth with a stick and a different matter is to dig with a spade. Of course, it matters. So the first idea here, which became the mover of the scientific and technical development, 
of both of them, the first idea was indeed to create great conditions for a person to live. At first, this was about the great conditions, but later, as the development of the achievements went on, the idea was not just to feed the hungry, but this idea never passed. But anyway, now we see a different idea. So now we see the idea of creation of comfort. So I just want to switch on something to press the button on the remote control and the television starts working and I take some minor thing and I can talk to Australia. You see, this is great comfort. Of course it is. Of course. And maybe it is very difficult here, but the great philosophers always compare. What do we have more here? Do we have more use here? or more harm here for a person. But in any case, the development is ongoing firmly in this direction and there are no means to stop it. You can't stop this scientific and technical progress. And now we've come to such an edge that we're about to cross the line. At least the scientists are warning us and frowning at us and urging us, but it's all in vain. As Mayakovsky said, the voice of one single man is quieter than a squeak. What are they warning us about? We are on the verge of creation of cyborgs. They are such computer people who will have all the abilities that regular people have, as well as all the reactions of a living human being. And if they are created in a human-like form, and if they are dressed accordingly, what sort of people will appear among us? What are the scientists warning us about? On the one hand, it is amazing, they could be our servants, but the scientists tell us, no, they won't be your servants, they will be your lords. Their reactions will be many times faster than those of regular people. And if, at last, they will have all the functions of regular people and they will be able to reproduce themselves and to develop on their own and they will be able to reproduce indeed, you should understand. So why do we need these regular people who can do so little compared to this computer person? So now we are just arguing and have some theoretical discussions, but we are moving towards this and we are moving very fast. And if we look at the other side, if we consider what is happening at the biological level today, what do we face here? Oh my God, here, if we get into the cell and we find out how it is built and we understand the essence of our gene fund. Do you know what we will do? We will be able to create a person with any predetermined qualities. So today we have people with different qualities, but this, this is a different matter. But when we have people with predetermined qualities, you know what horror it will be. It would be great if 
these inventions were in the hands of the holy people, of course, then they would create great people who would be noble, just, and so on and so forth, but no, in whose hands are all the inventions right now? Do you want to know in whose hands? Just please switch on the TV and take a look what everything is full of, what our TV programs are full of, what our radio programs are full of, what our magazines are full of. So it's hard to estimate exactly, but indeed it's more than three quarters of violence, murders, corruption, hypocrisy, mockery on a person and other disgusting things. But all of it doesn't appear on its own. So it is being done by some people. And what sort of people can be doing this? And what are they doing it for? Why don't they show and televise nobility, courage, real love, benevolence? Why don't they show this? Do you see what they show? You know, 2000 years ago, Jesus Christ said, you will know them by their fruits. So, who creates all of this? It is clear, isn't it? Isn't it? But something else is clear. If you pay attention that it turns out that the bottom line of all the information, of all the fiction and cultural information that we can watch and the light motif of all the art and culture and theater is. But you know what's curious? Some of you travel abroad and you switch on the TV set and you watch anywhere in Germany, France, United States. Everything is the same. So it's bloodshed, murder, you know, corruption, mockery on the family, and many things of the kind, and it's all around the world. So let's make a conclusion. It is easy to make a conclusion here, because why do we never make a conclusion? We keep saying, oh, it is so terrible, oh my god, why is it happening? But we never come to any conclusions. So people do it on purpose. Why? If we can tell that in all the civilized world the same thing is going on, so we have the same handwriting here, then it turns out that it is one global system. It means they have one single source. Do you remember this phrase that the Saturn rules the ball? So that's who we face today and that's who rules to a great extent over the world. So all the information, space, I guess it's three quarters, but it may be more or less, but it's hard to tell. But what we see is enough, so all of it is full with dirt and disgusting things. So if they are already the lords and they want to corrupt people and they don't want to make people noble or holy and their aim is dirt so what is it so the satin rules the ball so what are these people trying to do so it is well known that those people who control the mass media, they also 
control everything. So they have the mass media, they have the power, they have the money. What else do they need? Nothing. So you see, the scientific and technological progress it was. It started so simply, simply but how did it end? So the devil said, command the stones turn into bread. And this ascetic turned it down by saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So whatever God says, it means the truth, and when we speak of Christianity, it also means love. So that's what man shall live by. So that's how we can only live with the truth and with love, because otherwise nothing makes sense. And then, what temptations were there? Do you remember? The devil showed Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the world and said a very simple thing. thing. All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. So it was about the power over the whole world. And Jesus Christ said that it was written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. So let's just take a look at this idea, this thought, this temptation that every person faces as well as all the mankind faces this temptation. When we said that scientific and technical progress gave in to the temptation, to the first temptation of making stones becoming bread, because people just wanted bread and entertainment. So that's what we do all the time, just listen to some boom or something that is constantly suppressing us. So people get so used to this, to this culture of those rulers. Let's just take a look at how it entered our lives. We can't live without it. Do you remember our amazing folk, culture, songs, dressings? So we've put it all aside and we just have this strange culture now. So it turns out that Satan just wants that people worship him. And you know, the idea is quite simple. A person has such an instinct, you know, to keep accumulating everything, you know, and one never has enough, because it is a passion. This passion of greediness and of power, they never have enough. Never. You know, it is an abyss without any bottom. So this is the case. So there will be no end to it. The fight for power, you can watch very often. You see to what crimes it comes to and what it turns into. So, my dear, how long will you have this power? Today, at long last, you've reached it. In opera, Boris Godunov, his sins. It, it's been six years already that I reign at will, but there is no happiness in it for my exhausted soul. And so it happens. This is the insanity of power, or more exactly, the insanity of race for power. We face it on the international scale as well as on the personal 
scale. God forbid for someone to be possessed by such a passion. It's not for nothing that Jesus Christ rejected it by saying, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. So what does it mean that you should worship the Lord your God? God is the Spirit, and if you serve God, God is not just some being in some man-like image. No, when we say God, we say that this is the truth and love and good. So if we find some better words, this is humility, nobility, this is when you prefer someone else to yourself in the name of love. So you see what kind of values are the Christian values compared to what the devil offers. And of course you remember the third temptation when the devil offered Jesus Christ to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple in order to prove everyone else who he was. So this is the pride. How many things are done because of the pride? As we often heard, oh my God, what will people say about it? A person can do anything because of pride. So the Holy Father called the pride to be the foundation of all the passions. Just pride alone can substitute for all the passions. And pride alone is enough to actually spiritually kill a human being as a God-like being. So if God is love, then this is it. There is no pride in love and there can never be any pride in love so pride sees itself higher than anyone else so I'm the best I'm like no one else and this pride when it finds itself in a person and its highest point of development will be implemented in the final and ultimate Tsar of the world who is called by the Christ disciples the Antichrist. It's not just that he will be Antichrist or against Christ. Of course, this is as well, but it will be instead of Christ. So Christ is the Savior, but Antichrist will say, the Savior he is, but what did he do? Did he feed the people? He fed just 5,000 people? It's ridiculous. I will feed all the world. He healed just some people. So it is ridiculous. So the development of medicine will come to such an extent that there will be no disease that we won't be able to overcome. You claim that Jesus Christ is the savior from death, but people have always been dying and they are still dying, but we will find the gene of death and people will reach immortality, they will live forever, and if at the same time they will have enough food as well as entertainment, so who is better? What do we need Jesus Christ for? What did he do? And me, I will do anything for you. And for some reason, like 2,000 years ago, they warned us against this man of sin. So he was called to be a liar, a hypocrite, who will be so proud that he will call himself God. You said Jesus Christ is God. So what kind of a God is he? He did nothing. I am God. I will give you 
everything and what will happen so now we can read about it and hear about it a lot so we read a lot about how the population of earth should be reduced so there are too many people on Earth. Maybe we need just one billiard of people, or maybe even less. What do we need it for? There will be just a circle of the chosen ones, and there will be some slaves around them. But this will be the slaves that never existed. So in ancient times, slaves could rebel, they could agree to run away, to do something, but now you just say one single word and now it is in the center of information. So that's what you said. Goodbye. So everything will be under control. Can you see it that now we are moving forward to such achievement of the scientific and technological progress when every single person will be absolutely technically controlled? So not a single word will go by unnoticed and God forbid if it will come up to the possibility of mind reading. Can you imagine what it will be like? So these are the perspectives of today. But what does the Christianity give us and why will this man of sin will be called the savior by the world. Have you ever heard that we need an orthodox Tsar and what will he do? Well, he will be orthodox. So what will he do? I mean, come on, the church is free today. You want to be a Christian, you are welcome. So will he, I don't know, do something to all non-orthodox people, but then he will no longer be orthodox. It will be terrible if he does something to non-orthodox people. So the orthodoxy is free today. What else do you want? But anyway, our people are waiting. Maybe I'm just telling you the things that are too strong. I mean, just some people from our people. I don't mean all the people, of course. I'm just saying that some people are waiting for a Tsar, and what will he do? He will save our state from these burglars, from corruption, from injustice. So we celebrated 300 years to the family of Romanov, and did they free us from all of it? No. And do you remember the Soviet state? Even in the Soviet state in the USSR, there were no brothels which used to be in the Russian Empire. Was there any justice? Well, Please read Gogol. So what should we say? It is so obvious, but the idea is so amazing. So we are looking forward to a Tsar. So when Niktari, Saint Niktari from Optina was asked if Rus would had a Tsar, so he answered Antichrist, Antichrist, and Antichrist, full stop, or the exclamation point. So it's unbelievable. What is he saying? St. Ignatius Brunchininov, so he is our light of Holy Fathers of the 19th century, and he wrote, our people can and will become the means of the genius out of geniuses of Antichrist who will at long last implement the idea about the world monarchy. So you understand?
what it will mean. So Antichrist will be like a president of the whole world. It is written in the Holy Scripture that all the people will worship him. And this is a terrible prophecy that our people can and will become a means of this genius. Why? Because our people need just one single ruler. Jesus Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? But He said that my kingdom is not of this world. So what was He talking about? He was talking about a very important issue. We all think that happiness is what? I have problems with an apartment, with family, with my job, and so on and so forth. And you can look at a different person who has both an apartment and even more, and a family, and he has problems. He has one wife and he is unhappy, and he has ten wives and it's even worse. So, you remember this parable by Krylov when three wives were given to him and he hung himself in the end. So people dream of happiness consciously or unconsciously. So what is happiness? Happiness is the joy of heart. Where there is joy, there is happiness, regardless of the outer conditions and circumstances. As the saying goes, in a hut but like, this is a great proverb, but in a castle one can hang themselves, so happiness is the inner state of a soul. All the outer circumstances which surround us, they can be some complementary means to happiness, but in the same way this can be the opposite. So how can we reach happiness according to Jesus Christ? It turns out that it can be reached by the means of a life according to one's conscience. So, but not according to some general moral values, but what kind of a conscience should it be? You should have no evil in your soul. So you should treat others in the same way as you want to be treated. If you don't want other people to speak of your drawbacks, so you shouldn't go around gossiping about other people. You don't want people to judge you. You shouldn't pass judgment on others. You don't want to be envied because the envy leads to irritation so and to many other bad things. So you shouldn't envy. So Christianity aims at healing our soul. Or if only we could have in our souls what the Apostle calls the fruit of the Spirit. So what is the fruit of the Spirit? He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, love to everyone. So what does it mean? Many misunderstand love and have many questions regarding it. So in Russian language there is one single word for love, but in the Greek language, which the Gospel is written in, there are different kinds of love. So there is one notion which speaks of the moral love. 
It is called agape, the moral love. What does it mean? So it should be regardless whether it is a friend or an enemy, whoever they are, you should treat them with justice. You shouldn't act unjustly. You shouldn't take revenge. So it is not about love like you are pulled towards this person. No, you should be fair regardless of who, of who they are. And the Apostle writes that the fruit of the Spirit is love. But when we speak of Christianity, when we say love, in reality, Christianity opens the door to such a kingdom that it is even hard to describe. St. Isaacus from Syrian writes about it as well as many holy fathers do. He writes that if such a person will be burned alive ten times a day, for the love to people, he will not be satisfied with it. So this is the love of heart. Diaphatas in Greek, this is not the love of mind when I realize that I should treat people fairly, but this is the love of heart. And when a person has this love in their heart, they feel affection towards all the people and all the creatures in the same way as the sun shines on everyone regardless of whether this person is a bastard or a holy person the sun shines on everyone and the christian love is the same if one has the christian love in their heart they shine on everyone equally but this is the reality that can be acquired with hard work and the christianity shows the way to this real happiness if you have love in your soul you're a happy person we can just compare them to the young people when they fall in love so they're so happy why? Did something change? No circumstances changed, no jobs changed, but they are full of happiness. Why? Because there is love in their heart. Here is what Jesus Christ attracts our attention to. And Apostle Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, then joy. Of course, joy. Please remember St. Seraphim from, from Sarov. And every person who came to him was greeted with the words, Oh, you are my joy. Those people that he didn't know. So those people might have been sinful. And suddenly this person tells them that their his joy. So that's why many people were literally flying when getting out of his room. So speaking metaphorically, of course. So the fruit of spirit is love, joy, then peace. So there is a constant chaos in our soul, so many dreams, sufferings, hopes that don't come true, offenses, oh my God, and here we have peace. Those who experienced this peace at least once know that a person is ready to give anything instead of this peace. Then he says, long suffering so this is not a burst of indignation about different things sometimes so minor things but no this is patience self-possession long suffering then he says kindness goodness 
to everybody. So this is such great beauty, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Here's what Jesus Christ came for in this world. And if only people were like this, would there be any wars? Of course not. Would there even be arguments or quarrels? Of course not. Would there be animosity? It is impossible to even imagine that would be the kingdom of heaven on earth. What a path it is. So the question is, is it possible? Yes, it is possible. But it is possible to every person to to a different extent. Someone can do more and someone can do less. But the ideal is no good if it is no higher than our own head. So there were great people who reached this state and indeed living on earth they were also living in heaven. But Jesus Christ rejected these things which today are here and tomorrow they aren't here so today you have a lot of glory and tomorrow you had some vascular problem and you were buried today you killed someone and tomorrow you are killed so this is the hilarious happiness in this life when a person grabs this life. There is a story. One woman who was a billionaire was dying. He, she asked to bring her favorite dress. She just took hold of it. And when she died, they couldn't take out the dress out of her hand. So they cut it out and she was buried with this piece of cloth. So you see what we are trying to get hold of, something that we will give away for sure. Is it so difficult to realize? When someone dies, we are always shocked. Oh my God, really? Why? So we are like children. Do you know a single person who didn't die? Don't you know that you will die? What is it? So this is some infatuation or something. How will we name a person who is driving home and on their way they stop in a hotel and all the money they have they spend to decorate the hotel room? So then they tell, your time is over, please vacate the room. Don't we realize this? That's why Jesus Christ tells that his kingdom is not of this world, because this world is very changeable and unsure. It comes and goes, and every person will leave this world, whether they want it or not. So blessed is a person who is getting ready to it and who realizes it. So the goal of our life is not here. Here is some session or exam that we are taking. So we should show what we are striving for, what we are aiming at. You don't know when this life will stop. So please remember and try to determine yourself and to aim at the eternal life. That's what Jesus Christ is telling us about. He says that God is love. He's not a judge who punishes or gives out awards. No, but he is love that is like sun which shines on everyone. But if you misbehave, you are hurting yourself, so it's not about God punishing you, but according to the spiritual laws, 
you hurt yourself. What is a sin? We should understand it. It is a wound, and we hurt ourselves. So God warns us, please don't walk on the nails, you will suffer. But I don't like it. You know, I want so badly to walk on the nails. Really? And then you are wounded and you say, Oh, God punished me. Really? Did God punish you? God warned you. Don't walk on the nails. And what are you doing? So God's commandments are the warnings towards us. So please don't hurt yourself. And God is like a doctor who is ready to help anyone who turns to him with repentance. You see what the understanding is here. Not the understanding that there was in paganism, that God will punish you, of course. So I'm walking on the nails, and God warned me not to walk on the nails, and now I claim that God is punishing me. So, of course, this is ridiculous, and I'm always right, because I am a saint. You see? So God is a doctor who is ready to help and who is helping every person who comes to him with repentance and the commandments are just the warnings so please don't do it don't envy don't slander don't steal and so on and so forth so Otherwise, you will hurt yourself, you will suffer. If you take out a sword, you will die because of it. It's like a mother who warns you, please don't do it if you don't want to be hurt. That's what God does, because God gives us all the possible possibilities for us to reach the fruit of the Spirit that we have just discussed. So Christ and Antichrist are the opposite of each other. So Christ urges a person to acquire the qualities due to which a person will get the eternal good. But the Antichrist tells you, catch something here and now, so catch this dress and die with it. Oh, what a great happiness it is! So we should remember that if there is no God and if there is no eternal life, so if you believe that you will die forever, then this is just terrible. I don't un understand this face in your own eternal death. It is terrible. Where are my hopes? Where is all the good that I did? Where is my love? So it is forever. This is such a great despair. And these people who believe that God doesn't exist, they have absolutely no grounds for it. So they keep believing in it. Why? It is coming of that source about which we started to talk from the very beginning. Why are they showing all this dirt? Why are they televising it? It is the same source everywhere. So that's where the atheism comes from. Let's get rid of the holiness of love. Let's get rid of anything good, of beauty. So I think that we are so happy that we have the Orthodox Church and the Orthodoxy is being preached and we have an opportunity to read Gospel and not just Gospel. Today we had the exhibition, the joy of word. So what does it remind us of? Please imagine if here now 
we were told would you like to meet Anthony the Great? Anthony the Great? Oh, can I? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Please open the Philokalia book and you can read the teaching of Saint Anthony the Great and you will say, Oh my God, it is such beauty, it is such wisdom, it is such love. So we have the books by the Holy Fathers and they are just inexplicable good for us. And moreover, I can say that without reading this literature we will just sink in this dirt in which we live and which surrounds us everywhere so we should read the books by the Holy Fathers as well as the books by the Hagumen Nikon Vorobyov those letters of his it is not a large book but you will see the essence of this joyful orthodoxy that we are talking about at least one page per day it won't take you a lot of time so it is so easy to read one or two pages per day and this one or two pages will inspire us отпечаток. Поэтому думаю, что лучше бы не стоит. Вы знаете, вот вы пришли, вас пригласили на какой-то громадный прием, полно кушаний, но об одном из них вам говорят, вот это, знаете что, лучше не трогайте. Говорят, что может быть отравлено. Всего полно. И вот человек так, ах, съесть или не съесть. Я думаю, зачем брать сомнительное? А в данном случае эта сомнительность там в отношении этого присутствует реальная. Так, но ведь масоны, которые правят миром, вышли из лона церкви и должны бы придерживаться Западе Христа.